immer dieser Druck. Ja, auch mal ist gut. Ja, ich schieße zurück hier mit Fotos. Ich glaube, ihr seid alle nur für die Aufkleber hier, oder? Wäre nicht schlecht, bin ich auch mit einverstanden. Merchandising will benutzt werden. Gibt hier draußen gibt es noch welche, also ich kann gerne welche durchreichen, aber dann geht das jetzt hier los. Ich habe auch noch mehr, habe immer noch ein paar Sicherheitskopien dabei. Die Hausaufgabe ist natürlich, man muss das verstehen, ne, was da drauf steht. Reguläre Ausdruck kommt. Jetzt bin ich hier. Ja, nach dem Mittagessen muss man immer einen Moment noch warten, nicht wahr? Auf diejenigen, die schnell noch mal eine rauchen müssen und dann gleich noch kommen. Könnte ja sein, dass er auf der ersten Folie man direkt das Wichtigste verpasst. hat gerade noch die Karte gewechselt. Super. Ja, super. Wenn ich das noch zehn Jahre mache, komme ich auf den Flyer, Holger. Man muss Ziele haben. Ja, ich denke, wir sollten starten. <lacht> Der Druck hier. Der Druck wird immer größer. So. Ja, ich denke, jetzt sollten wir starten. Schönen guten Tag zur, zum zweiten Konferenztag. Der erste Konferenztag hat an meiner Stimme schon leichte Spuren hinterlassen. Aber ich habe eine Verabredung mit ähm, ihr getroffen, dass das jetzt eine Stunde gut geht. Und ähm, ich bin da guten Mutes. Ja, wenn man aus so einer Konferenz spricht, wenn man das mal irgendwann das Glück hatte, das mal zu machen, dann äh, ein bisschen Feuer fängt und es immer wieder gerne machen möchte, dann ist natürlich die entscheidende Frage so am, zu Beginn, worüber spricht man? Ah, come on in, Jeffrey. This changes the situation dramatically, because now I have to switch to English. <laughs> we are welcome. I think we have one chair here. Es ist kein Problem, wenn wir das in Englisch machen, oder? 
für, für ihn machen wir alles extra. Super. I feel honored. <laughs> Now you can uh, defend your product. So okay, let's restart. I, I, I got one chair. Here's one left. This is my luggage. Sorry. It, it can't be better, right? I don't know which, which uh, who, yeah. <laughs> Peter Kriegel in the back, Jeffrey Snover, Holger Schwichtenberg, Tobias Weltner, and all of you. No, we should get a picture in front of this. <laughs> you will see that on Facebook, right? <laughs> Marvelous. Thanks for being here. So, it's, it's obvious if you, talk, if you think about what, how, what can you talk about uh, such a beautiful conference with all that uh, extraordinary people here uh, on both sides of the fence. Um, I, th I thought what could be more offending than uh, to give them a title, um, I hate PowerShell. So, I think if you have children, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard. You just hate them. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> But at the same time, you love them. So I, I got to confess, I do not really hate PowerShell. I hate aspects of it. And I know many people who struggle with that. And I'm actually, what I want to talk about is how to struggle with PowerShell, with real life problems. Because uh, some of you, lots of you, um, let's say with a, with a good solid uh, development background, you do not see a few things. So I regard myself as being an admin. Of course, some, some, at some point in my life, I started to give trainings, do some consulting stuff. But more or less, I always thought I'm, I'm an admin. I'm not a developer. This, it wasn't really a choice. It just uh, it happened to be like this. And what I didn't like was the idea of clicking. So when I started in IT, I, I, and we share that, I think, uh, I started back in the 1990s uh, with uh, my first professional operating system that was uh, FreeBSD in those times. Uh, we had two servers, one for development, one for production. I've, I've been working in a, at an uh, internet provider during that time. And of course, on that server, there was Solaris. And back in those days, this company exists. So I think somehow we miss this now because um, Microsoft and Linux was really successful. I personally think that um, all the old Unix operating systems, they uh, more or less struggled um, being um, having such a good competition in Linux. And the other side of the market, uh, of course, this was Windows NT, very, very, imp uh, very important, very successful. And as we learn now, these things belong together, much more together than we always thought. I gotta, gotta give uh, Bruce Payette a quote. Yesterday, uh, he told us that Azure is more or less OS operating system agnostic. That's marvelous, because we never thought that from a Microsoft employee we could hear something like that, like this. There is not a single, there's not a single week when I show that this is really true. I'm not saying it because you're just in front of me. There's not a single week where I do not show a video um, or a picture of Jeffrey Snover with the slide something like uh, Microsoft loves Linux, GUIs on servers are evil, and all that stuff. And honestly, your customers sometimes have a bit of a problem with that. Let me say it like that. Um, so, and now you have to convince people that there is an improvement in PowerShell, and they try it, the admin stuff. So let's, let's see what comes out. I have a lot of demos. Uh, Maybe uh, all the uh, super technical stuff here can explain something a little bit better than me. But let's see what I found out, what I think is uh, interesting. 
all the pictures, you will find it there, you will find the slides there. And uh, the best place, believe me or not, best place to communicate with the people you never thought that you would meet in person is, from my perspective, it's Twitter. I have, I had a lot of talks with Jefferson over before we even met, and I'm very thankful that this exists because sometimes it fills the gap. So if you struggle about something, you think, is that really true? Will it this be the future? Follow him and follow all the other guys on uh, Twitter. This is serious information, believe me or not. My personal opinion. Yeah, this is what I, uh, that's, that's what, what is real in my life. People try to cope PowerShell, try to learn something, and then I say, oh, wh what that? I give you a li little example. Curly braces for the Germans in the house, geschweifte Klammern. Uh, curly braces are offending admins. They don't get it. And if you try to type on a German keyboard, you know why. It's sometimes it's really hard to get all that special characters. So they don't get what, what the fuss is all that about. I'm, I confess I do not really hate PowerShell, but of course there are lots of people who say, what the, dot, dot, dot. So uh, a few of them, they are somehow split into uh, two positions. Uh, it can be quite interesting to read uh, what they think about it. Um, if you grab my slides, I have all the links and they so see that. But of course, to be honest, there is a limited amount of people who really uh, do not get it, but there's a huge community and you are the proof that, uh, that it's like that. What I do now is I tell you some uh, very, um, I tell about my opinion and your mileage may completely di be different. So um, it would be fun if we talk after, after the session, if we talk about what you think uh, could be improved, right? So I won't talk about comparison operators. So t take the chance and uh, get uh, Bruce Payette, uh, ask Jeffrey, why is it like that dash greater than, what's the background of that? It can be quite interesting to talk about. Maybe you later on you can tell something about it. I don't talk about the comparison operators because when you get it, the thing is done. Um, of course, execution policies. It must be an important topic, otherwise you wouldn't uh, talk so much about it. Execution policies are not a security element. People don't get it, you changed it, fine, but we still need to talk about that. Uh, but I won't do this in this session. Uh, the fun stuff is, I personally say during trainings, I, I like right host with this dash foreground color something because you can show something like that. But I always say I gotta pay five euros for coffee each time I use it, but it's because it's extremely dangerous to do this. Because uh, you simply write to the host, you all know that, so uh, in your production environment you shouldn't use it, but this is not, uh, not a real problem, uh, you just have to know that, so I don't wanna talk about it. And so on and so on, but th the most important thing is what I investigate. The biggest problem is, of course, PowerShell is not Bash. Uh, some people, you won't never reach them, right? But maybe this is the reason why uh, now you do it the other way around. You provide bash support, uh, which will be very interesting. So this is uh, completely my personal opinion. This is what I think is a little bit annoying in PowerShell from the perspective of an admin. So let me show it um, to you. So the first thing is something very classic. Um, and I'll switch to my uh, environment to show you that it's even worse than you thought it would be. I thought about it, so some commandlets are not so good. Let me say it like that. Uh, sometimes you think, why is it so hard to make it a little bit better? And there are some uh, typical candidates. For, for example, I love to show people test connection, a simple ping. But if you talk about pipelining, you really do ask yourself, why, why doesn't it work like that? Because that would be a huge improvement, right? But it doesn't work. Yeah, but, but, but why? We will see that in the, in the uh, Windows help. Let me do it like this. 
um, if, you walk, if you watch carefully for the parameters uh, that this uh, command has, you will see here is missing something. Pipelining by value. If this would be true, this would work. So what could be the reason that the guys that implemented that uh, didn't uh, provide uh, that? I do not think that there is a reason because this is the only parameter that can be pipelined. So if you have simply one parameter, you can pipe it by value. Uh, that would be an improvement because this, very, this simple example would work. And if we show it, uh, if we see it like this, you see there is nothing else like that. You can go through all the help. So I think, uh, to me personally, to explaining PowerShell to, to new people never saw something like that. I heavily focus on um, pipelining. And this would be a gorgeous example if it would work. So, okay, I do it the other way around. I create an object. So now I can explain to people what is an object, because if you have an object, this will work. Let me see it like this. Let me show you. If you have something like that, you need structured data, right? And to me, being an admin, I always ex uh, explain it like this. Imagine you have an Excel sheet, and you need a headline, and you need the data. And then you have structured data, so that's what we call an object. And uh, providing an object with a fine um, headline, the headline must equal the, uh, the parameter, everything is fine. So if I do it like that, this will work. So, but this is not w what I'm concerned about. This is just a runner up. One more command that, that I think w would be great. A great example for what is wrong in the world of PowerShell. Uh, the next thing, also very, very nice. You know about common parameters? A very important principle. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. So anyone who did that before, knows there mustn't be a share now, right? Because it's what if, for the Unix guys, a dash s simulate, right? So if I now look for a share, I created one. You see? So the common parameter doesn't work. So now you could say, um, hmm, this is pretty new. You may figure it out when it was invented. So the, the nice thing is about it, do you know how I came to this? I read TechNet, because in the official documentation, um, there is one command explaining this. I never tried that out, to be honest. So I learned it from TechNet. That's the good news. So, <laughs> but this is not what annoys me. The, the price for, I think, the worst commandlet that I use, and honestly, there are so many useful commandlets, but the one thing that really drives me nuts is get service. And anyone knows that, because if you, if you go to a PowerShell class or read a PowerShell book, there are two commandlets you always learn first, that's get service and get process. And there is pretty special, pretty special commandlets. And get, get service is really, really special. So figure out what is, what's up with that. So first of all, from an admin's perspective, the most important information, of course, is are my services running? And just because not every service has to run, sometimes you don't know should it be started, yes or no, the start type, of course, is important. So in the default output, you don't see it. So I would expect that if you do a select object, dash properties, uh, asterisk, you see everything. So if I do it, I already know what I've been looking for. I did it in this line, line 28. I hope you can see that all. Can I enlarge it a little bit? So the, the most important uh, information right now is uh, here beyond that. This is start, at start type. So now I know that this is set to manual. Everything is great. And now you say, hey, wha what the heck is that? Never saw that before. Because normally this information is not provided, and people now tend to think this is Windows 10. No, it's not. I show you, and I show you that the way I, 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 I explain it to uh, to administrators. I, I do it with the GUI. I uh, drop this. I go to uh, Windows 8.1 machine, and uh, I can run that again. I prepared it, and now you see, 
on this Windows 8.1 machine, you don't have it. There's no information like that. There's another Windows 8.1 machine. There you can see it. So what the heck is that? Yeah? But it doesn't have to do anything with Windows 10. No, no. No, no. It's a little bit more complicated. And now the administrators that I know are running a little bit into trouble uh, because they say, hey, what, what is that? Let me explain what's the reason for that. Get service is nothing else than an envelope. There is a .NET class. And this is the, 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 the main idea, to have simple commands. You explained it uh, beautifully. Um, just uh, making it a little bit nicer, easier for the admins to get it, because the information was always there. There is no need for a command like get service. So if I run that, you will see this extra ex it's definitely the same thing. And if I limit it like that, you will see I got again my special AJ router, whatever that is, service. So now the question is, if I know that, wh what's the data that it's focusing on? And the simple answer is, um, it's a matter of the version of the .NET framework. That's it. You need a you need a certain version of the .NET framework. It's 4.6.1, I think. And if you do the upgrade, I saw that on the Windows 7 machine. Um, if you do all the the upgrades, you have that. So and now we run into trouble because the developer wouldn't have any problem with that because of course you update all the .NET classes. But the operator has 10,000 machines. And he's not ready to upgrade to .NET 461 just to see the start type of that, right? And now it's getting a little bit worse again, because um, just for research, you try to find out which .NET version do I have on my machine. I, I don't know who invented that. Maybe you can tell that later, Jeffrey. But uh, it's a little bit ludicrous because uh, you get to figure it out in the in the uh, in the registry. I uh, explained this in this comment to myself more or less, and of course I provide the scripts to you so you can check that out on your own. Um, to cut it short, this is what you need to check. There's one registry key. There's another registry key, and you investigate that. You will see that on my machine. Let's start that all. Hope it gets it. I have .NET version 4.6.1 or something like that, because now you have to figure out what this minor number here is to get the real version, because the, the displayed numbers do not relate uh, to the official product names, to the official version numbers. I think later on, uh, guys like Holger can explain that perfectly to you, but it's a little bit uh, crazy that it's uh, complicated like that. Check it out on your own. I provide the links to the official documentation, but what we take for now is um, it's a question of the .NET framework. It has nothing to do with the, with the, the uh, command let. The command let just uh, explores the data in the .NET framework. So if you need the start type, you can get it. I proved that to you. Yeah. And now we come to the, to, to the admin solution. Now that we understood that this is more or less uh, unreliable, I got to go back to my, uh, I got to go back to my uh, other block here, to my other region, because there you see, I uh, enlarge that a little bit. Everything is there. I think I haven't tested it that, but I think this will work with Windows 2000 or something like that, because the WMI provider was always there, even in times before PowerShell. So this class, the Win32 class, has all the data you need. So any admin would always use that. So the disadvantage for me as a consultant or as a trainer is, I gotta explain get service because this is a very basic commandlet. But on the other hand, I've got to explain it's, uh, it's not so useful. Use the WMI class. And WMI is uh, a little bit challenging <coughs> because it's not so nice, right? If you got it, WMI is one of the most powerful things. But um, 
it's definitely not so nice typing, right? And exploring the data. And with the sim objects, it's got better. But on the other hand, now you learned get WMI object, and now you get relearn all the stuff with get sim instance. And this is a challenge again. So in admins, do not like that. Admins do like Robocopy, VI, <laughs> yeah? Grep, fine stream, <laughs> something like that. Uh, things that last for 30 years. That's what we like, right? So, this is now what I call it. It's um, I'm not quite sure if it is the proper English word. Um, there is kind of PowerShell esoteric. So, and uh, I, I named it Lost in Translation. And if you if you if you see it like this, you might get an idea. The the, the professional saying you. Uh, let's talk about the comparison operator replace and the uh, method replace. That is a little bit strange because, um, first of all, admins do not get why dash replace is a comparison operator. What does it have to do with that? My answer is it's simply because if you type in get help about comparison operators, it's explained there. That's the reason why it's a comparison operator. So don't think too much about it, take it as it is. But now, Yeah, of course, but um, what, what you what you explain now is uh, for the for the admin who never learned something like that before, it is uh, uh, what's it called white space? It's uh, noise. Yeah. <laughs> what what, what, does say? What, what does he say? So let, let's think about it. I got to explain for the English people in the house. This is a very famous German soccer player. <laughs> so just imagine. You would you uh, have to hire him? That would be great. Maybe he's a talented salesman or something like that. And now you need an Active Directory name without the umlauts. So you would try this. That's great. And now you replace the u with the ue. No problem at all. You can do that, of course, with the method. That's the same thing. And now you see you have two possibilities. No problem. Until you do the second test. <laughs> and now you focus on, oh, what was so different? It's another soccer player, okay. But do you see the difference? What's the difference? Case sensitivity. Case sensitivity. Oh, great, I, I got to stand up for that. Because I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm doing this like for 15 years. And I always tell the people, one of the uh, myths of Windows administration is that it is case agnostic. It is not. Read about the, uh, the invention of uh, Windows NT. Go to Redmond, catch Dave Cutler. If you get him, I don't know. Um, he's still alive. He's still a Microsoft employee, so you can talk to all the guys, but you don't need them. Because you will learn. From the very beginning, Windows NT was built up very alike to other enterprise operating systems of that time. Um, of course, it honored case sensitivity, and it was very open. So this was the time of OpenNT, Interact Services for Unix, something like that. You can't, in the 1990s, you couldn't run uh, Unix, uh, Unix uh, applications on it because it was POSIX compliant. Uh, Bruce Payette is one of the guys who, who did that. I talked to him about that. And if you listen now carefully, you might have heard that the POSIX standard requires case sensitivity. So Microsoft did something that is sometimes very challenging. They try to pretend that they do not have any idea of case sensitivity, except sometimes it's different. So, And in this case, um, you will see um, the behavior uh, in Windows, generally spoken, is case preserving. I hope that this is the good technical term. I always use that. So inside, Windows makes a clear decision between um, capital and small letters. But um, if it comes to, let's say, Windows Explorer, if you try to create two files, simply the distinguish would be the small or letter ca uh, capital, the small or capital letter, uh, it wouldn't work. Because Explorer doesn't allow that. And why doesn't it do that? Yeah, because of compatibility to the old operating systems. You remember Windows 95 and stuff like that. 
So keep that in mind. PowerShell is the uh, same thing. Uh, you, of course, you can uh, distinguish uh, the letters. But now you see the replace operator doesn't do that. But the method does. So no change. Case sensitivity is honored in one of this. And the next thing, and now it gets really challenging, try that on your own if you, uh, later on, if you uh, pick up the, the examples. Now, this is really uh, nerd stuff, because now it gets into regular expressions. Uh, regular expressions, again, is something very, very special. I utilized it here on the sticker. So backslash b uh, means that it must be the begin of a word. So not, not it, it doesn't matter where, where the umlaut is. So now the question is, can I use regular expressions with PowerShell? Yes, of course, but it depends. Because once again, let's see it here. It worked, right? This doesn't work. Because the replace operator has no clue what regular expressions are. Um, and the same thing you have here. Yeah, you see, it doesn't change anything. And I think you all know, or most people of you know, that you can uh, switch on case sensitivity, but you have to do it. So if you change this with the C, it will be case sensitive. This is a challenge for admins, you see. That's what I'm talking about. So it's very confusing to have that. Yes. Oh, excuse me. A little typo. Thank you. So again, no change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, of course it is. But it's uh, sometimes very confusing. We will see that later on, that you always have a lot of choices. And admins do not want a choice. I used to say, let's copy some files. What the best tool? Robocopy. That's it. There's no second answer. <laughs> so if you need to replace some umlauts, uh, yeah, you can do that with the comparison operator. You can do that also with the method. The problem with the methods is devs do like the methods. Because generally spoken, uh, they uh, they used to use that stuff. Very often they're quicker. They can read it because it's very alike. It, you do it in C sharp or something like that. But that's the complete different perspective uh, when you never developed something before. So I like more or less the comparison operator a little bit more because I do not need uh, to figure out uh, what do I need for, is it curly? Is it what, what braces are it? So figure it out. So this is very confusing. Um, is it something that I do not like? I think it makes it a little bit complicated. Do I have a proper solution? No, because you have to decide. To chip is to choose. Sometimes you have to decide what you do, and this is what comes out. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. But believe me or not, for many people, it's a challenge to see that this is different at all. Yeah, For you, this is it, it's natural. You see it the second you, you, you see the script. But uh, you have to have a certain background um, to see it the second you open the file. Yeah. OK. Yet another one. I have 10 points. Now you know two of them. It's getting a little bit more fun later on. Um, next thing, consistency. Keep it simple and small. I do like it like that. So let's imagine something like you show people this, control J, and now they try to do something like that. So this is great. Now they have a loop. So take care of the cur curly braces. So next thing is, you try it again and again. You do this with a four, something like that. And whatever you do here, the curly braces are always uh, aligned in front 
of the keyword, right? Because this is the proper way you do it. And now I tell you what my people are doing in, in my, um, from my experience. Now you show something like pipeline. That's great, it's gorgeous. I always tell the people, this is the DNA of PowerShell. <coughs> so we do simple stuff like that. This is the uh, count operator, and you want to count from 1 to 10. Do it like this. And now you throw that all into a pipe. And now you do it like that. And the second you show that, people do it like that. And guess what happens? This won't work. Because this is completely different. This is something completely different. Because the script block is a parameter. Uh, the script block belongs to a parameter. This is not a keyword in PowerShell. So if you do it like that, it won't work because it's waiting for the process. So what we do need now is, of course, you can do it like that um, to make it more clear that there is a parameter and you need to provide something for that very parameter. But nobody uses that. Nobody. It, the, only, uh, the only thing where you use it is if you use Tobias uh, steroids, they, they put it in. So that is great. But I never saw anyone writing that down. And now you can do it like that. And now it will work. But again, uh, what, what is that special character? Where, where is that? The back tick? Where is that? The back tick uh, right, right, right. But I think I, I wrote it down because I think that makes it a little bit more clear what's the problem. And of course, in real life, you do it like this. Huh? That's like that. Yeah. yeah. Everything, every special character is bad on German keyboard, right? <laughs> so. Something like that, yeah. So I, I put it here, if you want to figure it out. And I have not yet talked about that there is an alias for, for each object, for each, which makes it a little bit more complicated to understand the differences, right? So if you, d if you see it like that, all the loops are the same. And you have to figure out that for each object is not a loop, although you use it like a loop. Because you're looping something, right? Yeah, you're right. Again. <laughs> Yet another classic thing. We like diversity. Anyone can do it like we uh, on its own, on his own, on her own. But again, let me do it like that. Is that good enough? I think it's good enough. Um, last year in Essen, Bruce told about the, the background story uh, behind uh, dollar underscore. Ask him, it's very, very funny. Um, he invented it, right? Um, I think I get it, it's fine. And if you uh, do not like to type so much, then you can uh, use the abbreviations, that's no problem. But it's getting a little bit more complicated if you do something like that. If you use, uh, just wait a second, you can see it good. If you use, use something like that. So the fun story about that, I know that you invented it in PowerShell version 3 because people said they do not get the, sp the, the special character, the dollar under sign, to make it a little bit more easy. Uh, I think uh, it went wrong. Customers do not think that this is more easy. They do not use it. Um, so this exists, but take care, beginning with PowerShell version 3. So OK, forget about that. Then next thing, to make it a little bit more Unix-alike, we also have an in invention, simplified syntax. And now it's getting a little bit worse, because now you get completely rid of the special pipeline variable. But there is one disadvantage, and that's the reason why I never explained that. I explain it to you because th you're the professionals. My students will never know that this exists, simply because <laughs> it doesn't work if you have multiple conditions. So it doesn't make any sense to me to use that, because it's very alike that you, you, that you have one condition and yet another condition and yet another condition. So this works, line 17. Let me show it to you. 
this is great, and this won't work, so I commented it out. See it like that, it won't work, because you need the array syntax if you have multiple conditions, right? Ready for number six of my uh, annoyances? Yeah. Right. Who wants that? <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Right. That's that's the problem, right? If you want to get the, get the Perl developers, okay, yeah, they're fine with that. But how many people are that? And how many customers you had that never programmed before or 20 years ago? I don't think that they will embrace Perl, and so they will struggle with that. I think. Next thing, one of my favorites. I named it Mr. Bool and the evil switch. The switch statement is something very special. And if you read about the switch statement, switch is something like put the lights on. <laughs> and if you read about that, everyone tells you, do always use switches. Always. When, you, when it's possible, use it. You can read that in any blog. I can show you. So, and then you ask yourself, why do people do that so rarely? Because if you take care here, if this line seven would be a switch, you don't need no true. But it's, it's not a switch. There's something different. And you see it in the ISE, um, and now you see you, you have to provide something. Huh? So if you do it like that, missing an argument, do it like this, it's not a switch. Now it works. So what's a little bit confusing is that sometimes, just because this is not a switch, and there are very few switches in the basic commandlets, if you count them, I tried that once, there's a handful in all parameters. And you ask yourself, why? I, I show you why it is like that. There's a reason. Um, simply because this is not a switch, but it feels like a switch. You can provide any, any value. So sometimes it's true, dollar true, something like that. You can write one, zero. Sometimes it works because uh, the variable is casted to another type, no problem. It works somehow magically. Till that very moment that you, just wait a second, you want to remove the AD user. And now this is the only switch. This is a real switch. This is what a switch looks like. But I want it the other way around. I want to deny the switch. And the only way to do this, the only one that I know, is uh, to use the colon. So now again, oh yes, thank you. Syntactically correct, <laughs> but not what I was meant to be, something like that. So you see that? So um, let me explain it here. It goes like that. This is a little bit more in detail. And of course, it's for you to grab the scripts and get it. Um, so you think about what, what could be the reason for that strange behavior. So, and if you, if you write your own scripts, you immediately find out what is the problem with switch. I show you. I have a short snippet. To me, it explains what's the problem with switches. So let me, let me show you this. This function actually doesn't do anything. It's just the start of a script. And right here, I decided to create a switch. The user can say, hey, I want to check if this PC is online, and I check it by the means of WMI. Uh, the real script, I didn't provide any functionality. This is just for the formal structure. The se second thing is, I uh, created another parameter, enable WS man check, more or less the same idea, but this time it's a Boolean. And the second, uh, the third thing is I created a string. So in, in any of these three cases, uh, more or less, I simply want to put the light on or off. It's always the same thing. But I have to make a decision. Do I use a string? Do I use a Boolean value? Do I use a switch? So and obviously, the switch is the best idea. But it has a disadvantage. 
And the disadvantage you can see here. If I call it, just let me uh, run the script, uh, the function once. So now we can uh, focus on the output. So let me do, do this function once. And um, remember, there's a switch, a Boolean value, and a string. So by default, that's the way I created this. Everything is wrong, so my script later on wouldn't do anything useful. So now I switch it on. There's just no problem if I always use the colon. No problem. Because you remember the switch. Sometimes I want to explicitly say yes or no. But it's getting a little bit worse. And now stay tuned here. If I do it like this, because now I see I didn't provide the colon, which is perfectly fine for two of my values, my parameters, but not for the switch. This is for an administrator trying the first steps with PowerShell, reading a book. This is a challenge because it, uh, no idea what is, what's wrong with that. And there is another big problem with switches. If you run that and you do not name the parameter, and I think this is the reason why so few switches are used with the core command line, because people know that at Microsoft or wherever they were created. If you do not name the parameter, you never know which one is the one that I enabled, disabled, something like that. And that now we run into a problem because the switch was the first one, which is a little bit of a problem because now you see, if I run it like this, although I provided true, true, the values that I gave is the first thing, the WMI check would be false. So if you know that, if you really got that, there's no problem at all. It's a little bit confusing. So what's my problem with that? My problem is not the switch. My problem was to remember, I asked myself, why is it so confusing when I simply use the built-in commandlets? Because my opinion was, use switches when they make sense, but it is very rarely used. So this would be the perfect example for a switch, right? but it's not used. I got one more. I got a few more. I got to hurry up a little bit. Um, this is not a, a, a real problem. I, I try to explain that very quick because this is, uh, this is a, a complete session. Token bloat, you can talk about that for hours. Um, this is not a problem with PowerShell. What I'm focusing now is the uh, Active Directory web service. That's a little bit uh, a challenge. Um, but from the perspective of an administrator, this is all PowerShell. This is all Windows, and this is all Microsoft. This is the problem. So it doesn't see that this is an Exchange team, this is an Active Directory team, maybe this is VMware. This is all PowerShell. And now you run into this problem. I create an OU. I uh, pick it. I create my user, Tony. I create a group, another group. And now I do something like that. I hope you got it. We will investigate that in a few seconds. Um, and now I created 10 groups. And I show you what I did in the graphical user interface. If everything uh, was right, I hope so. A little bit of problem with my uh, domain controller. Uh, this is a beta version, right? So uh, this morning I uh, really tried to get it up. So uh, yes, I want to show it uh, here. So what I did now is that I, I was Tony. Pardon me, just a second. I should create Tony. This is Tony. And now I have Tony. Something went wrong. Uh, this is my uh, example if I do Active Directory. It has nothing to do so much with PowerShell itself. Um, this is my user, Tony, and he's a member of one group. Hopefully, you will see that in a minute. No problem at all. Everything is fine. But the problem is that this one group, again, 
is a member of another group. And this is domino. And it goes on and on and on and on like that. And if you try to investigate that in, in the graphical user interface, you have no chance. Because you will never see that there can be a problem because you always see one group membership. So, but if you investigate that, and that is the great thing in PowerShell, of course. If you investigate that with a PowerShell commandlet, Uh, not a circle, it uh, just goes on and on and on and on. One group membership uh, nested into the other group membership. So just wait, wait a second, you see it here. This is the direct group membership. And this is the, the nested group membership, so that it's gorgeous. And now, where's the problem? This is a great example for Active Directory. Yeah, the problem now is there are multiple possibilities to get that group nested, uh, this nested group membership. I show you the good old DS query will also work, and uh, the, the, all, all the guys here in front of me know there is something like uh, special search filters in Active Directory, so great. Everything works great. So what is the nicest one from all the commands that I showed you? It's quite easy. Of course, this one is great. Right? This is the one that will fail first. That's my problem. Because the second you get a token bloat, this one won't work, which is a problem with the Active Directory web service. And I will show you how you can uh, investigate that. It's quite easy. You simply create a little bit more groups, right? So, and if I do that, that will take a, a few seconds. Uh, I will show you later on. Um, now, my user Tony won't be able to log on. The disadvantage of this is I won't see that with the ad get AD account authorization rule. Why is it like that? Because there is a limitation in the web service from what I know. So you got to reconfigure the web service. Administrators do not do that. So they won't use the get AD account authorization rule command. Right? They won't use it because I showed him, hey, guys, you can use this or you can use this. This, that will work. The only thing that will not work is the command line, the nicest one. So this is annoying, right? There's no happy ending, right? It's nice if you only have 50, 50, 50 group memberships. So this will wait, uh, this will last a few seconds. So uh, let me uh, get to the next topic. I uh, come back later here, uh, show you what it's done. We reach the final, the final uh, four. Right now it's getting hot, and I gotta explain you the the last ones are very easy to understand. So there are some some aspects in in Active Directory that I, I name it as the DNA. I told that before, and that is for example it's pipelining, and uh, how you deal with arrays. Arrays are very important. But if you talk to developers, they they say yeah, that this is this is actually not an array. What would you have? That's a kind of list, right? Because technically, be, please, if I'm wrong, tell me. Technically, what exists is you create an array, you get a sheet of paper, you write something down, and then you would put another thing on it, and then you throw it away. And you get another one, and you write it again. OK? It's static. So that doesn't mean anything if you have 100, 100 elements. I show you what it means. If you have 10,000 iterations. So I show you the output first, and then I show you the code. So I did something tricky. I know from one of my colleagues that there is something in .NET that you call an array list. Now this is much more powerful. If you use that, it's lightning fast. Because this is a real array, yeah? something you can put a lot of elements in, and then you add something. If you do the same thing with an array, it's horribly slow. So now the problem is, why don't we always use array lists? Ask him. I don't know. I show you the code because um, if we talk about uh, array lists, you really got to have to name it. It's not too complicated. But again, for an administrator, I don't want to do that. 
if I uh, have don't have to do it like that, there's no need to do it. And next thing, I show you the array. Just wait a second. So it's more or less the same, but uh, this this uh, in this case I s use a simple array. I do not even have to write that down. That would be fine. So and just be wait, wait a second with your question. I just run that again so that you see that there is a huge problem. So if I do it with 20,000, it will take a long time. So let's see if I, if I got right. So the array list, again, is lightning fast. Less than a second. And now if you want a coffee, nah, OK, nah, it, it won't last so long. But you feel it? It's seconds. We wait. Your question. You know, my, my problem is I don't don't think I'm offending. I I I, I, mean, I mean it as a joke. I, I'm not an electrician. If I go to that switch, I want to get the light bulb on. That's it. I don't know why. It's lightning. It, it doesn't interest me. I just want to put on it and it works. That's it. Anything else doesn't matter. So number four. Let's just for a second go back to my Active Directory. Now I did it. And you hopefully will see that we have a little bit of a problem. It won't work. You see there is an error message. Try that out on your own. If you do Active Directory, this is a nice demo. People like that. Pardon me? So and uh, anything else will work. Check that out. For example, DS Query, because it doesn't utilize the uh, Active Directory web service. It, it takes a, a just a second because uh, now I have 12,000 groups. And if I would try to log on as this user Tony, you would see that he wouldn't, co go, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to log on. So that's it. Is there something like a limit? That's the problem. I don't know. I haven't found anything like that. If you show me one, I, I'll be delighted. <laughs> so, uh, of course, you can you can uh, you can always fix things, but but this should work out of the box, I think, right? Yeah, but maybe there is a limit to the number of groups in the service. Yeah, that is that is what. Yeah, ex exactly. You got it. That is what we're investigating, right? Uh, but this, the problem is, this little demo script tries to investigate that issue so that you know about it and can say, hey, Mr. Smith, you have a problem. You have too many group memberships. Let, let us talk about that. So this should work. Um, it, doesn't have, it doesn't solve the problem with the total load. It just gives you the chance to see the nested group memberships. So OK. So I'm, I'm, watching, I'm observing my clock. So just uh, sorry, I don't want to be impolite, but um, just go to this was number four. So and now. Because uh, I think it's getting a little bit boring if I click on my code all the time. Uh, let's go a little bit back. In my PowerPoint slides, I uh, highlighted a few things. And now you saw my number 10, 9, 8, 6, Mr. Bull. You know him. Um, OK, there are solutions to that. Um, is that really a problem of PowerShell? It's a problem if you see the product at all. If you say, this is Windows, I want it to work. And this gets a little bit complicated, because I, I struggle when I do certain things. So and this is my number three. I know many people see this as a feature. CDXML, uh, don't, don't get me wrong, I think it's horrible. Because what is that? One last demo I show you, and more or less it is what you see here. CDXML is a very interesting technology where you can provide commandlets without a developer doing anything. This is the, I think this is the main idea, because you have a structured data, you have a class, and the commandlet 
gets to life simply from the class. And it's very, very easy to do that. And I show you that with what, just one last uh, example. This is this one, just a second. Um, and then we're done. The last ones do not need a demo. So this is, was more or less the great um, demo that you did yesterday, Jeffrey. Um, you need some local accounts. Back in those days, you did it with a WMI query, something like that. Um, and this is not only local, this is uh, generally accounts, uh, also the Active Directory accounts. And if you want to uh, provide an, a commandlet, which does this directly, you simply have to do something like that. So you simply have to create this file. That's it. So if we open that, there is no magic in it. This is just a formal structure. And everything you, more or less, uh, the every anything you need to do is that you provide the WMI class here. That's it. More or less the same. The rest is magic. I just just copy paste, and it does exactly the same that the WMI query did. So, um, great, right? So what's the problem? So now I have something which does exactly the same. This is get local account. This is what I crea created through CDXML. Again, it takes a while. And here you can compare if that is really the same. Yes, it is. Takes a moment. Hmm. So what's my problem with that? I got another session tomorrow. I will explain that in detail. The short form is, if the class is somehow disorganized, the command that will be somehow strange. So the problem is you have such a huge amount of CDXML commandlets, which is a feature. But the problem is it's a little bit hard to use them because there was not a single developer thinking about it and doing uh, some polish, let me say it like that. And if you're interested in that a little bit more, come to my session tomorrow where I talk about uh, networking. Um, CDXML provides a huge amount of uh, commandlets, but it's really hard to understand what does what because there is no polish. Yeah, we, we're finished in a minute. So back to that. I got two more, and uh, the last ones are quite easy. Um, and let me, let me explain why, why I think this is important to talk about that. I don't want to spoil the party, right? I love it. Yeah? I never had a better time than than teaching and uh, doing stuff with PowerShell. Um, the second one is quite obvious, right? You know what that means? Während den Anfängen in German. Yeah. This is, um, wait a second, I did something. For the English speaking, resist the beginnings. Did you see what the problem is? There are commandlets with uh, not using the singular form. Please do me a favor, put these pe people in jail, right? <laughs> I think you're, <laughs> because if we, if we start doing it like that, yeah, I, I know that you're not responsible for that, but again, from a customer's perspective, you're using Azure, this is Microsoft. It's PowerShell, it's Microsoft. It can't be true. This must be the singular form, right? And the worst thing, to chip is to choose. I don't like updatable help. No, not at all. I think a product should should chip with the proper documentation. And I, we have so many problems in the classroom. I, I, in, in, in most weeks when I do some training, I can't show the help files because the servers are not uh, connected to uh, the internet, uh, the, the, the client operating systems are not connected to in the lab environment to the internet. I can't utilize the, the help files. Yes, a proxy stuff like that. Yes, 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 yes. This is my, my, my biggest annoyance. I'm not talking about localization. We can talk about that for hours. So why should, why should you care? So to wrap it up, because 
this slide I changed uh, this morning because I think, what, what's your target audience? And he told, and I think this is very, very important, not, not because he's sitting there. He's talking about DevOps. And the meaning, correct me, is we need a proper language to talk to each other. You told me on Channel 9, you told all of us that developers and operators couldn't talk effectively because th they do not understand each other 10 years ago. And DevOps mean we give them a tool, it's good for the developers, it's also good for the operators. And now I see, you can see it here in the PowerShell conference, ask yourself, the developers taking over. Uh, PowerShell is, is getting more and more in the direction of C-sharp, Visual Studio, stuff like that. That is great, because I like it, but if you want to have the ops, the admins, if you want that, what you told us yesterday, I think uh, keep it simple and small. So I, I personally think uh, we shouldn't uh, work too much on the, uh, it's not up to me to, d to explain that, right? I, I, I simply talk about that, but I, I think we shouldn't talk too much about um, getting more features in it. I'd like a little bit more polish. That's what I think. Because honestly, I read the Monad Manifesto. You should read it. I, he knows that. And uh, it's, it's so great. Every, everything is in it. Everything. Yeah. You want that to be understandable. So re read that again. This is a one, one little part, piece of the parts, a piece of the puzzle. Um, if you want to get rid of that. Uh, because we're heading towards that. <laughs> and ask yourself, that's what, what's going on. They do not understand that. That's why my, my life is great, because people come to me and say, hey, I want to I I understand what I copy-pasted. Right? We don't want to live with that. I got to confess, I love PowerShell. I'd like some polish. It's a gr great pleasure to have you all here. I hope you liked it uh, with Jeffrey. Um, if you have questions, I really like questions. Maybe we should uh, leave the house in a few seconds. Tobias. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Grab me outside. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you all. Yeah, of course. It's an honor.